my name is Marisa Caicciolo. Uh, I'm an artist and curator. I'm the director and founder of Building Bridges Art Exchange. Um, I moved to United States um, several years ago, over 20 years ago. Uh, well, I just want to share with you a little bit about my practice when after doing some animation and, and uh, working in like two movies in animation, Rograts Go Wild and the Wild Thumberries movies, I decided to really put all my focus on, um, on my career as an artist. I um, study art history, like I say, and, and psychology. So, of course, I had a big... Um, big changes when, when they moved here and of course the, the shocking, the impact of the culture, of being in another culture, living in another culture for the first time in my life. I was very young and uh, after finishing my, my work in, the anim in animation I decided to just focus in on, on the, basically on the art career and uh, my career as an artist and as a curator. And so I, I shift completely. And over 15 years ago, I decided to create this platform, of course, with the help and support of many people. We, we have a great group of people working and thinking together. And uh, we created uh, Building Bridges Art Exchange. Building Bridges Art Exchange is a platform, it's a nonprofit organization. We're really doing um, mainly like four four focus on the on the platform the mission statement is to create understanding and peace through art between countries between cultures uh which i think is very important right now especially where in the moment that we live in today um i think we are in a very unique moment in history um, we never experienced, none of us really experienced anything close to what we are experiencing right now all over the world, which is a, um, it's a global crisis with the pandemic uh, that is affecting everybody and every sector of our lives, every layer of our lives is, is um, the emotional, the spiritual life, uh, the economic, the politics, the social life, our social environment. So it's really affecting everybody. I think uh, um, going back to the practice and really how how I, I, I see or how much I focus I put on my practice as an artist and as a curator, I think we have a very strong moment. Uh, we are in a very unique moment where we really can take action. But before I got there, I think I want to share a little bit more of my of my story, uh, or how how I work, how I get there, how how I used to connect people. It's very interesting because building bridges, or more than the, the title, or the name of the organization. For me, building bridges is almost um, a life purpose, uh, a lifestyle as an artist and as a human, as a person, as a woman because um, we should be literally moving around ourselves, moving in this world, building bridges, building bridges of love, building bridges of understanding um, with everybody, with every person that we encounter, with every uh, different culture, with every different situation, we should really embrace and create this this bridge and uh, and sometimes bridge that gap. We are all have a different views uh, with our, with our own practices and with the practices of everybody else is around us. And I think we have to create very strong uh, parameters within ourselves. Uh, we have to, first of all, as an artist, I'm talking here, and of course I have a certain tools being a psychologist, but I think we have to have this um, strengthening, okay, what I'm trying to say with my work, what I'm really, um, how I wanna connect with the world and uh, what I wanna say to the world and how I wanna share all this, that I have inside myself. And at the same time, not only engage with others, but show to, to others and to society how strong we can be and how we can work together as well, um, based on love and respect, no? So I think going back to this, um, 
I just want to talk a little bit about this specific moment. I think a lot of um, us, uh, we're facing a very, um, very, very strange moment because for most of the artists, which I work with a lot of them, and most of the artists, we really do work in kind of isolation. So most of the artists will really embrace that situation, that isolation. We enjoy our time by ourselves. We enjoy our time alone and we can connect with the material. We can connect with the project that we're working on and in a totally different way that, that, that other people probably relate with their isolation. So that's a very big uh, plus in a moment like this. But also just I was thinking the other day in it's very interesting because I was thinking how much power we have as an artist today. How much power do we have? You know, every time that something is happened, even if they want to fix or clean an area, they call the arts. They call the artist. They, uh, they call the artist to have studios, to open new studios, to clear or clean up a sec like a sector in a city. Um, why? Because the artist can create and change spaces. We're going back there to talk about spaces today. And they can literally shift all the spaces, shift the, the spaces, shift the, 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 the environment, the energy of a place, and, uh, and radically change completely the area. So, of course, after that, the developers come and they do their own thing. And probably most of the time, the artists get kicked out of the space. When I talk artists, I also, uh, the art world, because galleries are invited as well. And um, uh, so, but the interesting thought that I have this morning when I was thinking about how to, what I want to say is this is a very important moment for all of us, for all of us artists, all of us creators to come together because in a way we are a very important key for this particular moment. For this big crisis, artists, curators, art institutions, artists in every level, in every form, um, we are the ones always thinking of out, out of the box. So I think in this moment, in this moment, where the, the, where this crucial moment when we are all um, really trying to figure it out different ways and people try to figure it out different ways and there's a lot of fear, a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty. Um, and this particular moment when everybody was forced to be inside and to really put a mirror in front of ourselves and really go within and start seeing ourselves and, and all this in this within the global picture of society and the planet, no? When we were forced to, to do that, to, to think about that, I was thinking, oh my God, artists, we do have the answers. Most of the time, we do have the power. We can really, um, we can really create different scenarios. We can think out of the box. So I think artists, and of course, on top of that, we can really speak loud and say the truth very loud. You know, artists are really the ones saying the truth about politicians, about what's going on in the politics, in the economics. And we are we almost have the permit to do that. We we really have that access in something. It's a big crisis in 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 the humanity itself. We we just reach to a point that we have to change patterns we have to really create a different patterns of, of living. So going back to that is the power, just, just try to express the power that we have as an artist. And we have as an artist and uh, as a creators in any form that we have this power to bring forces together, to bring people together, to connect things. And uh, going back to that, I think in my, in my own practice, I always do that. I try to create, uh, to engage different parts and, and different areas in the, 
in, in, in the body of work and in the organizations that I work with and et cetera, et cetera. But of course, within my own practice as an artist, I also struggle sometimes very much because of my situation or my scenario between being an artist and curator. And I have to say that a lot of time I ask myself and I question myself, I question myself strongly about that. Uh, and I always say, I, I'm doing the right thing. I'm just doing it in the right way. I'm very, um, let's put it that way, kind of a bipolar in this. Um, I never, ever, ever in all my, my life put a work of my own self in one of the exhibitions that I curate. I basically think that uh, as an artist, we really need somebody else that can see the work and can really support us in the election of the work, in the selection of the work, in how we present the work. And I think it's really good to, de sometimes as an artist, we cannot detach from the creation that we, we have done. So we need to allow somebody else to do it. So that's been my entire life, uh, having this uh, people asking me, why you don't put your work? Why you don't show your work in building bridges? Or why you don't show your work when you curate and exhibit? And I just truly believe that I, I, I cannot be honest with my own work because I'm attached emotionally to that. Uh, so I cannot be, uh, I cannot see the work within the structure of an exhibition or a curatorial project uh, with a different eyes that I see everybody else's. So I think in a way I always separate myself as an artist one side, as a curator another side. And most of the curators that work with me as an artist, they know because they know if I don't work with one of them, if they don't invite me for a project, if they don't invite me for to be part of a biennial or to be part of a museum exhibition, I'm not showing my work. So it's an interesting uh, role and it's a very, a very unique. I feel like that's the way that I see my work or I feel about my work. So, of course, with the different practices, I just been working with so many artists. I was so fortunate to work with all these artists all my life and all over the world and, and with institutions as well and curating exhibitions in a very big museums and, and curating biennials and having a practice, a strong, a strong practice that, that, that goes hand to hand of course, with the reality, with what's happening in the world now. Most of the time, most of the time, my, my, either my own work or my curatorial practice is focusing on the, um, either environmental, um, um, exhibitions or exhibition that the main focus is about a social or a political issue, um, immigration, uh, any kind of different topics, but topics that I personally engage with, that I can't uh, connect with. Of course, as an, as an immigrant, as a woman, as a, as a woman immigrant, I moved here when I was 20, 20 something, very young, and I've had to go through all the, the difficulties in a way of an adaptation and that's why as an artist I really work uh, with the subject of the skin because I really believe I think that the skin is the layer that separates our inner world that are, are the, the outer world and really what is connecting with us and what is playing a very important role and actually as many um, of the animals we kind of change a little bit the skin this cocoon uh, when we move to another country, when we move to another, even not, doesn't have to be another country, when we move to another place and we have to reinvent ourselves in order to uh, engage with the culture, engage with the locals, engage with our persona there, you know, we change, we shift. Uh, going back to whatever, whatever I was saying early, as an artist or, or, 
or practitioners when we really do work within the art world. We have a big, big diversity and inclusion, which I truly believe that we should be diverse and inclusive in every level of our lives from since we are born, since kids, like we should be. So it's not only, of course, right now the institutions and everybody's trying to do a big effort, but we have a big responsibility because we should teach that to our kids. We should really incorporate that language, that inclusion and diversity in our own households, in our own homes. And so there's a lot of things that right now that we have the space, that we have this gift to have a time to stop and to rethink about what we're doing as humans, what we're doing as artists, what is a role in society we can really shift certain things. Right now I'm set what we're doing and how we are doing it. It's going to be a lot of changes. And, and just when I say reset, it's even to start uh, creating this understanding of this dialogue about spaces, about spaces. Even this, especially this virus, has a lot to do with the space, with the space, with the distancing. And of course, when we're talking about distancing and, and when you go to the public spaces and the private spaces in a city, you have this population that lives in a very small, small spaces, all one on top of another. So how do you create the distancing and the space between people there? So of course, these areas are the ones more affected by the virus, probably, uh, in a certain... So we're just, we're moving back to space and, and to the space how we're really dealing and working and how we can restructure uh, everything from the space to the use of the space, to the use of the mind space, to the use of spirituality and connection between the source and the community and the others. In a, in a moment like this, we need to start uh, working as a collective with a, with a union, with a collective energy. And in every, uh, I think, in, in every level. So, of course, that in the art world itself, it needs to be more collaborations and probably collaborations and, um, and openness to have more, more dialogues between sectors, between different sectors. And for that needs to be a little more equity, more, more equality as well. Uh, and so we are reaching a point that we are in a huge, huge crisis, but we, we have the interesting thing is that we do have all these open doors, open doors with opportunities to start doing things from our own space with a different mentality, with a different um, thought behind the, 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 the projects. And I think, um, again, as an artist, we have a huge, huge, huge opportunity to open a totally different conversation where it's not only, where no longer few people have that voice, you know? Where no longer few people have that voice and where it's a replica of the corporate world that we have out there. If the art world within is going to be a total replica of the corporate world, you already see it. That, that, um, that system is not working. The, the system as a core is not working and it's not a healthy living. It's not a healthy living for the planet, for the individuals, for humans, for the... So I think in a way, uh, if we keep like doing a replica, replicating a model that no longer exists, that no longer serves to the, to the humanity, that no longer is healthy, uh, we're not going anywhere. So I think in a way the invitation 
is to everybody to start rethinking where I'm at at the moment, where is my practice, how I can keep doing certain practices that actually um, can make everything stronger and we can make a, a stronger statement together. And I think artists are doing it already. Like I'm so excited and I'm so happy to see really everybody kind of connecting and doing programs and connections all over the world and having these conversations about a new vision. And of course, right now is a, is a moment uh, for us to, to really stay kind of inside and uh, thinking about the next moves, the next steps, but not making big, big decisions because um, I, think it, I think we're not ready to make huge decisions because this, this pandemic, this global crisis is not over. It, we are just trans, we are like in a transit, we are in the middle of it. And we don't even know how it's going to end exactly, when or how. So I think in the meantime, the only thing that we can do is just getting stronger and stronger as an artist with our practices, with our really own practices. We can get things together because at the end of the road, we will need to have things together and organized and artists we need to have a strong statement an artist statement for our entire vision as an artist so we need to have a very strong statement as an artist we need to have a portfolio together and i'm telling you this because sometimes because i'm doing a, a big time of my life is focused and dedicated to the curatorial practices and being the director of a nonprofit, uh, I just sometimes push that aside and I push myself aside. And, and this period, these two months already, uh, it's been, they've been a fantastic time for me to go within, kind of, uh, you know, uh, go within and, and start working and looking at my own self and my own career as an artist and what I really want to do or how I'm going to present my, uh, myself as an artist. And I think going back to that, for artists, it's super important to have a package ready. At the end of the road, at the, we have still a little more time where we can be really um, isolated in our own spaces, in our own studios. And I know that some of the artists, and probably for a lot of you guys, I feel the same, it probably is not that easy to um, to keep creating. It's not that easy to uh, to keep producing a lot. Of We're no longer few people have that voice and where it's a replica of the corporate world that we have out there. If the art world within is going to be a total replica of the corporate world, you already see it. That, that, um, that system is not working. The, the system as a core is not working and it's not a healthy living. It's not a healthy living for the planet, for the individuals, for humans, for the... So I think in a way, uh, if we keep like doing a replica, replicating a model that no longer exists, that no longer serves to the, to the humanity, that no longer is healthy, uh, we're not going anywhere. So I think in a way the invitation is to everybody to start rethinking where I'm at at the moment, where is my practice, how I can keep doing certain practices that actually um, can make everything stronger and we can make a, a stronger statement together. And I think artists are doing it already. Like I'm so excited and I'm so happy to see really everybody kind of connecting and doing programs and connections all over the world and having these conversations about a new vision. And of course, right now is a, is a moment uh, for us to, to really stay kind of inside and uh, thinking about the next moves, the next steps, but not making big, big decisions 
because um, I think it, I think it, we're not ready to make huge decisions because this this pandemic, this global crisis is not over. It, we are just trans. We are like in a transit. We are in the middle of it, and we don't even know how is going to end exactly when or how so i think in the meantime the only thing that we can do is just getting stronger and stronger as an artist with our practices with our really own practices we can get things together because at the end of the road we will need to have things together and organized and artists we need to have a strong statement an artist statement for our entire vision as an artist. So we need to have a very strong statement as an artist. We need to have a portfolio together. And I'm telling you this because sometimes, because I'm doing a, a big time of my life, is focused and dedicated to the curatorial practices and being the director of a nonprofit. Uh, I just sometimes push that aside and I push myself aside. And, and this, Period. These two months already, uh, it's been they've been a fantastic time for me to go within, kind of, uh, you know, uh, go within, and and start working and looking at my own self and my own career as an artist, and what I really want to do or how I gonna present my uh, myself as an artist. And I think going back to that, for artists, it's super important to have a package ready. At the end of the road, at the, we have still a little more time where we can be really um, isolated in our own spaces, in our own studios. And I know that some of the artists, and probably for a lot of you guys, I feel the same, it probably is not that easy to, um, to keep creating. It's not that easy to... Uh, to keep producing a lot of this and everything in the middle of this roller coaster of emotions and and change and daily changes because everything is changing with this pandemic and new rules and some areas will be totally gone and we will need to face or reface a different moment. I think it's important for us to at least get ready and get ready in every level, get focused, get centered, get in clarity what we're trying to say, how we're trying to say it, uh, what kind of material do we really need to have ready to present ourselves to anybody. We need to be ready to talk from uh, a director of a museum to somebody in, in, in a radio station about our works. So basically to have the statement ready, the statement together, what we're working, what we're doing, why, and, um, and having all these very important parts um, of our career, of our uh, production, of our lives together. And this is the best time to focus on that to focus in, in, in reorganize, reshape everything that was a little bit probably unfinished or unclear or not in this moment. We can use that energy and this time in focusing on that. Um, as myself, I've been doing that. I did uh, a full, um, actually, uh, edition of a book, of a book with the last decade of my work. Uh, the last decade of my of my work as an artist, and it was very interesting for me to go within and start researching and and getting all the pieces together from the past decade, and uh, having the time to do it. Uh, so at the same time, I think if, you know you can you can really figure it out what what is your playground let's put it this way i think uh, in uh, in my case i have to say i love to do both i really do enjoy uh the curatorial my curatorial practice and my artist practice as well it has a, a big component actually I, I really is a large component uh that i share in both practices because i really focus in social and, and political issues in both of them and and um so i think in that way 
I have to say that it's a very it's a very interesting to create or to have or to know where we really stand at this moment. So I want to share a lot of more material because I do have, I want to share some images of my work and I have some material that I was already here, some of my uh, latest curatorial work that was uh, around um, uh, All Women Are Dangerous. That is an exhibition that was in Building Bridges uh, in December, January, January 2020, January this year, until February. So almost until the time of the of the confinement. So this here is the catalog of an exhibition that also I curated in uh, uh, 2017 uh, in Chile, in Santiago, in Telefonica Foundation, which is the collection, uh, Arte Limite collection, um, one of the biggest collections in, in Santiago, Chile. And um, I hear it's like major artists, Salustiano, a lot of artists that uh, some of you know, like super interesting and, and strong artists from all over the world. And um, so this is another of the projects. And of course, there's a lot, a lot that I want to share with all of you uh, and that I would love to keep talking and talking for hours. I can do that. Uh, but I think this um, is actually uh, interesting. Uh, that I can have this open conversation with all of you. And I want to say uh, again, thank you so much, Catherine, for the invitation. I really hope that you enjoy or you connect with some little pieces of the whole conversation here and there. Um, there's a lot to talk. It's a, it's a very... Um, it's a very interesting topic. What's going on right now and also what's happening in the art world and what we can do and, and all this. So again, thank you so much. And uh, if any of you have any questions or you want to reach out, uh, please just contact me uh, through social media. I will make sure to answer you back. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, my name is H.C. Huen, um, and I'm currently located in New Jersey, a little outside of New York City, and by, you know, outside New York City, I mean I'm literally right across the river. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank the city of Santa Clarita for inviting me in participating in the New Heights Arts Development Series. Um, I would like to give a special shout out to my friend Katie, who's the arts coordinator there and she is expecting soon, so congrats, Katie. I'm super excited for you. Um, I am both an arts administrator and interdisciplinary artist working in New York City, so hi from the East Coast. Some background information about myself. I was born and raised in Massachusetts. Uh, I received my BFA at the Massachusetts College of Art and Design, um, also known as Mass Art in both painting and art education. Um, so I do have a background in teaching as well. Um, while living in Boston, I was teaching at a specialized public arts high school um, right before I moved to New York City, where I had attended Pratt Institute um, for my graduate degree. And I had got a MFA in both painting and drawing, um, which ironically, I'm not really considering myself as a painter anymore. <laughs> Um, so I'll get into more detail about my practice as an artist later in the video. Um, right now I'm going to focus more on my role as an arts administrator. Um, so I primarily have a background working in the New York City nonprofit arts sector um, with a focus in arts administration and development. And currently I am the operations coordinator at the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts in New York City. Um, it's located in Midtown Manhattan. Um, right below Times Square, so you can literally just throw a rock and you're there. So the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts, also known as EFA for short, is a 501c3 public charity that is dedicated to providing artists of all discipline with space, tools, and a cooperative forum for development of both individual and collective practice. Um, we are one of the nonprofits that are fortunate enough to own our building, and we occupy 10 floors in our building. Um, and most of our floors are studio space for artists. Um, 
our organization has three major programs, um, EFA Studio Program, EFA Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop, and EFA Project Space. The EFA Studio Program is open submission and juried membership that provides subsidized studios. Um, the program maintains about 90 studios and provides members with career development opportunities such as studio visits with art professionals and professional development workshops. And they host um, their biggest event of the year in the fall, which when we open up our building and all our studios are open for the public to visit. Um, our second program is the EFA Robert Blackburn Printmaking Workshop, also known as EFA RBPMW, which is also a mouthful to say. Uh, um, this program is a professional full facility cooperative print shop that offers affordable workshop access and unique learning opportunities for artists and printmakers of all skill level. Um, last but not least, the third program is EFA Project Space. EFA Project Space is a collaborative cross-disciplinary arts venue, also known as a gallery, um, that hosts exhibitions, projects, performances, seminars, events, and um, the SHIFT Residency, which is a residency that supports arts workers in revitalizing their creative practice. So through my position as the operations coordinator, I actually do a lot more than what my position suggests. Um, I assist the organization with office management, tech IT, development, facilitating organizational communication, and I also assist with programming. So basically, I like to call myself the crack filler of the organization. Um, I fill in for whatever is needed. Um, it's a fairly open and flexible position that I enjoy, that I can get my hands in as many pots of the organization and be able to take on a lot of initiative on the projects. So from my vantage point as a arts administrator, um, in response to the current pandemic, uh, no matter how much an organization can be prepared for emergencies, this pandemic really proved that you really can't prepare for everything. It's a really strange moment of our time um, where we really have to rethink about every aspect and how we operate in our daily lives. This pandemic has really hit our organization hard, um, as well as many others, in forcing us to shutter our doors as we shelter in place. Uh, this brings on a whole plethora of issues that you know we had to deal with, um, which includes a huge loss of income and having to find funding sources to help relieve that. And it's really hard with the current landscape where everything is very competitive and scarce. Um, and also we'd have to think about like maintaining our staff and like, you know, with the huge loss of income, we're like, how are we going to fund and maintain keeping our staff? And um, also how are we going to continue our programming? Um, and you know the adaptations that are needed so that we can still service people even though we can't do it physically. Um, so it really becomes an existential crisis which makes it easy to go into panic mode. And obviously panicking is not productive and really you have to calm yourself down and approach everything in a step-by-step -step manner and be very transparent in communicating. When dealing with something that is unknown that leaves everything in flux, it forces us to develop a time management strategy that compartmentalizes our task into three parts, the now, next, and later. Um, for the now part, it comes down to focusing what is most essential to the organization and making sure that that is the most urgent matter that is handled first. So for example, our organization, what we defined as essential is our staff because without our staff, we have no one running the organization and we'll have no programming to serve our constituents. So it's important to deal with these urgent matters first and always keep an eye out for what is next. And you know, you really have to be aware of like what's happening in like the current landscape in terms of like socially, culturally, and even politically, just so then you can prepare for it. Um, and so for the later part, for any type of programming that is dealing with contingencies that are dependent on too many unknown factors or moving, moving targets, it's better to just postpone them 
So, you know, for example, if you have a project that involves a lot of collaborators um, that are organizations and individuals, if one ends up, you know, falling through, um, it becomes a chain effect and, you know, the whole plan will, you know, unravel. So, um, like, as an example, I was talking to an artist um, a few weeks ago, and she had mentioned that she had a residency that wasn't able to host her in the summer. And as a result, you know, she was dependent on that residency to create work for a show in the fall for this gallery. And so now she has no work to show and she, you know, unless the gallery is willing to postpone the show to a later date, um, she might have to cancel her show. And so, you know, for these types of situations, it's good to be open and flexible because, you know, everyone's in a strange position and don't know, and like Bill doesn't know how to deal with it. Um, and so, you know, we just have to be understanding and just, you know, be there for each other because otherwise we'll just all be left panicking with no plans. Um, so during sheltering in place, I participated in numerous webinars. Um, one of the resources that I really like is Charity How To, and they have a lot of free webinars that you can participate in, um, ranging in various topics um, in response to coronavirus, such as communication strategies, fundraising, and staff involvement. Um, and from these webinars, the best advice that I received is that during this extremely difficult time, organizations really need to step up and take on a leadership role and show that they are there for the people that they serve. Um, and this means that organizations now have to shift their tone and how they communicate with their constituents and really express compassion and support. Um, you know, this is a time when people really need that sense of community and, you know, we're all isolated in our homes, feeling disconnected and experiencing cabin fever. So, you know, now is not a time for organizations to like go quiet, like, you know, they really need to be robust now and be creative in the type of programming that they um, are producing to give people a sense of community and things to do at home. And, you know, you just have to be present and push through it. And, you know, the organizations that will survive this pandemic are the ones that are gonna be most visible and active at this time. So to stay visible and active, you have to continue your programming, even if it means you have to adapt everything that you do to being virtual. Um, and for us, that was a huge task to do with our three programs, you know, we had to rethink how we're going to coordinate studio visits, how we're going to do our classes and demos in the print shop, how we were going to present exhibitions and events. Um, and you know, this is a huge shift in operating, but there are a lot of helpful resources in making that transition. Um, it's important to collect as much information from both inside and outside the workplace, um, you know, be on top of the news, see what tone what the tone is um, shifting to and how people are being affected. It's good to see what other organizations are doing in making that transition to being online. And there are numerous articles and like resource lists on you know the internet um, to really find this information. Um, and you know right now having a sense of community is important and really reach out to other organizations to start a dialogue about adapting and to even collaborate by sharing you know, resources. At this time, you want to produce programming that responds to what is currently relevant to people to help them cope with the current situation. Um, what we did at EFA is that we started to host more events through Zoom and Instagram Live in forms of like performances, studio visits, discussions, demos, and online classes. Um, as a side note, was it our events are free and public. For those who are watching, you are more than welcome to participate in our many events. I'll provide our website um, on this video if you'd like more information. Um, so anyways, back to what I was talking about. Um, for online programming, it may be daunting if this is something that your organization has never done before and you're worried that it might not be successful. Um, don't let your fear hold you back in hosting an event. 
this is uncharted territory for many organizations. And, you know, one thing that I found out that is helpful is conducting a survey. Um, you can conduct a survey in the form of an email before, you know, organizing, organizing any type of events, or you can do a test event. And then, you know, for platforms like, like Zoom, like you can conduct a survey directly in the event. And, you know, that's the best time to do it because your participants are already there and they can answer it directly as opposed to doing as opposed to doing it in a email where, you know, it might sit in someone's, you know, inbox. They might not even look at it. So I had the opportunity to take initiative in organizing an event during this pandemic about an issue that really resonated with me, um, you know, which is the increase of tragic and violent acts of like anti-Asian and anti-immigrant racism. Um, in response to the coronavirus, you know, it was egregious to hear and read the horrific stories. And I actually had a conversation with a colleague and she had mentioned that her partner had experienced a physical incident and had a hard time sharing um, their experience. And I later found out that there are multiple Google documents where people would anonymously shared um, incidents that they've experienced. Um, and it really shocked me in how common these incidents are and that people really needed an outlet in sharing, um, you know, their incidents. And so I ended up proposing my idea of having a discussion about this issue um, to my colleague at EFA Project Space, who at the moment was hosting the Immigrant Artist Biennial um, curated by Katia Gorkowski. And they were working on developing a Zoom series in response to the pandemic um, related to the project. Um, so we ended up organizing the event and hosted it on April 22nd in form of a round table discussion um, where participants were allowed to share their experiences, fears and hopes. And, you know, the discussion broke out into break, um, breakout sessions after for more intimate conversations. And while we were planning this, we had this like huge fear of formatting the event because it was, um, you know, an experience of like hosting breakout rooms, which we've never done before. And it was also um, the fact that we were dealing with a super sensitive topic that we weren't sure if people were actually open and talking about and you know we ended up pulling through and making a safe space agreement and outlining guidelines and having a discussion around a sensitive topic world um sensitive topic so that people were able to talk openly with no judgment and so it really was focusing on that it was a safe space um and to our surprise, we had a great attendance. Um, I think we had like maybe like 80 people who attended and many of the people were open and like willing to be vulnerable in sharing their experiences. And it was um, really great to see the warmth and support um, that people were giving each other in this roundtable discussion and that there were a lot of like resources being shared. Um, and so, you know, it made me realize that this was an event that people really needed and they really needed that type of like humanly connection and be open with each other. And, you know, it, and like, you know, just to emphasize my point earlier on, like people just really needed a sense of community at this moment. So the big question that I'm pretty sure we're all curious about is what will the art world look like, you know, after this pandemic? To reiterate my points earlier, you know, this is a time for us to be really proactive and we have to reframe this question that's being asked. Um, and we really should be asking, what do we want the art world to look like? And this is a time for us to really assess what is worth preserving and, you know, what new measures are needed to be made and so that we can innovate um, kind of an art world that is sustainable for everyone. So I'm going to leave my portion as a arts administrator there and transition over to my personal side as an artist, the more exciting side, I guess. Um, 
I'm an interdisciplinary artist and my practice ranges in various mediums such as installation, performance, video, photography, as well as many other, um, you know, depending on my mood and what I'm willing to explore. Um, my practice reflects notions of identity, power, and oppression, and social behavior, often through my alter ego, the dunce. The dunce is a character that is um, black and white, um, checkerboard, and likes to linger in spaces that are often undefined and ambiguous, um, both physically and psychologically. Um, this character stems out of my identity as a Asian American woman. I've always felt that my identity lingered between two different cultures and, you know, being part of the model minority, I always felt, you know, being invisible. So this character is a response um, to that, you know, being ambiguous and a invisible orchestrator in a lot of its performances and actions. Um, and actually, the dunce is going to make a guest appearance later in the video. So at this moment, I've been working out of my apartment and creating my work. Um, so a lot of it has to be manageable in terms of sizing and medium. Um, and recently, I started creating these latch fiber pieces that play with text. Um, and earlier this year, I created this huge piece called Feels with the word feels all over it. Um, I was playing with the idea of comfort objects and you know things that give you security and ironically wanted to juxtapose the word feels all over it to express the feeling of being overwhelmed by different emotions and needing something to comfort yourself with um, while processing them. And even though I made this um, project earlier this year, you know, I started thinking about it and like it really resonates with me now and how relevant that feeling and process is um, during this pandemic. You know, I went from being overly stimulated in like the New York City environment to like transitioning to being at home isolated. Um, you know, things are a slower tempo. I have a lot more space. Um, and I've been finding myself being more attentive in everything that I'm doing at home. And so it becomes very ritualistic in a way. Um, and so, you know, I've been thinking about this idea a lot and I'm planning on creating a series um, out of it and to reflect more on this very contemplative moment. And with that, um, I'm going to hand this off to my alter ego, uh, the dunce, to kind of walk us through and having our own quiet, contemplative moment 